Right guys, so as I said in my little introduction video, welcome to lecture seven, where we look at the second of our three historical film movements, uh, which is Italian neorealism. So the first thing we say, and the, the important thing to note is um, that unlike the Soviets, we were talking about the Soviets in the little introduction video, the Soviets uh, had an immense contribution in terms of technical form, so technique and editing and so forth. The Italian neorealists, their big contribution is in terms of content. So that's the very important thing. It isn't about technicality with the Italians per se. It's about the content. It's about the things that they captured on camera the kinds of things that they spoke about, the way that they filmed them, right? That's their big contribution. So it's not form, it's not technical form, it's all about the content. What is within the shot? Okay, so that's Italian neorealism. Let's get into it. So what's our overall focus? Uh, our overall focus is an exploration of the impact of the Italian neorealism movement and its impact on contemporary film makers. And remember, we always do that. We don't just look at uh, these film movements in, in a historical sense. Of course, we start with that, but we always look at what um, impact have they had on contemporary cinema, cinema today, cinema in 2020. And the Italians, and you can note this already, they are particularly important, and we'll see why, for South African filmmakers, South African makers of documentary. They have a wonderful um, contribution to make to us. So what are we going to do today to try to understand this, this, this movement, the Italian neorealist, neorealist movement? Uh, we're just doing a short introduction. It's not going to be a long lecture. Um, the longer lecture will take place next time in Lecture 8. We're just doing a brief introduction just to, to get you ready or comfortable with some of the, the, the major concepts within or the major uh, techniques used by the Italian neorealists. Uh, today we'll be looking at, very briefly, the historical context and the cultural context of, of these, these guys, right? So we're looking at some wonderful directors here as well. We're looking at the works of uh, people like Rossellini, Vittorio De Sisa, um, a few others that have slipped my mind right now, um, Fellini. But uh, we're going to look at some wonderful filmmakers in a very kind of uh, evocative, sensual, thoughtful way of, of doing cinema. So... We're going to do some slides. We're going to, it's about six or seven slides or so. Like I said, it's nothing too overwhelming up front. It'll start getting a little bit more hectic in, in, in lecture eight as we read Pachafici together. Uh, and then, as you'll see, there's that second point. Next week, this is lecture eight. We are going to go into a far deeper, more sophisticated uh, exploration of Italian neorealism when we read Sergio Pachafici. And that is from your course reader. So next week in lecture eight, you'll have the course reader out and you'll listen to me speak about it and, you, and you'll take notes in your course reader. Uh, for those of you that still don't have one, I know we've got about 20 students missing one. I'm going to try my best to, to get you a link to that article. So at least you can have it in, in digital format. Okay, so we move on in a second. Right, so before we begin, there's a very, very important distinction. Students uh, often make this mistake, but you've heard me use the term Italian neorealism. And when I say Italian neorealism, I don't mean Italian cinema in general. Right, we have to make a very, very strong distinction between the two. And if you want to be very generic about it and a little bit uh, unfair, we can say the following. We can say, well, uh, Italian cinema in itself, the whole thing, Italian cinema would be bad, right? It's bad. It is negative. 
and B, Italian neorealism would be good and positive. So of course that's a bastardization, that's very unfair, but, it, but it's a useful way for looking at it in, at, at second year level, right? So Italian cinema was the bad one, uh, and Italian neorealism is a small movement within Italian cinema that's something very positive, that's something very good, that's a, um, th this kernel of goodness within a, a rotten husk. Okay, so A, you take a look, Italian cinema, and remember we're making a distinction between the two. We're saying Italian cinema is one thing, and Italian neorealism is, is something different, right? It's a tangent of Italian cinema. Uh, but A, Italian cinema is a broad classification that includes a large collection of films. And the cinema is highly problematic and has many criticisms against it. So the first one is the most important criticism, right? And that's that Italian cinema in general would ignore the reality of Italy at the time, right? So it would ignore all the bad sides to Italy, the poverty, the destitution, people in bad situations. It would just turn a absolute blind eye to that, right? It would act as if those things, those deprivations, uh, were not going on in society. It aimed to kind of present Italy in the most glorious way possible. The other big criticism against it was that, yes, it may have been called Italian cinema, but what it really did was just mimicked uh, American cinema. So both in terms of form and content and structure and all these things, it would just mimic uh, American cinema cinema right it would just be the italian version of the american film the same the same technical conventions the same types of stories it wasn't something that you could call truly italian right it may have geographically been in italy but that's about it so that's the two very big criticisms against italian cinema in general but then came along this, this, this positive force, Italian neorealism, the small little movement within the broader church that is Italian cinema. And when we talk about Italian realism, you can look at B. When we look at uh, Italian neorealism, this can be applied to a specific group of films. So it's a small clutch or a small collection of films produced in the 1940s and 1950s. And again, you want to circle that date. You will see that the 1940s and 1950s come up a lot as a very important time for cinema. Not just for the Italians, but for the Americans, for the French, for any kind of uh, uh, film movement. Um, right? You'll see it's an important date. So it can be applied to a specific group of films produced in the 1940s and 1950s that made use of cinema differently. That's very, very important. Remember, that's the whole theme of this course. How do you do cinema differently? How do you step outside of convention? How do you step outside of the status quo, as it were? How do you step outside of just repetition, endlessly replicating the same forms and the same stories told in precisely the same way? Right, so this, this Italian neorealism, 40s and 50s, and it made use of cinema differently than mainstream Italian cinema. Uh, as such, in many ways, it was both a response to mainstream Italian cinema and to the Hollywood format. Right, so it was a response to both those things. It said, both of you guys, you're not quite telling Italian stories, you're not telling them properly, you're not telling them ethically or truthfully. And we are going to, to, to tell our stories differently. We are going to turn the lens, as it were, to a different focus. And most importantly for us, uh, the approach of these directors, or the Italian neorealist directors, has had a lasting cultural impact. Still informing and inspiring contemporary filmmakers.
Okay, so we move on. We know that these guys have had a big, big impact on contemporary filmmakers. But let's just talk a little bit about them. What was their historical context? These Italian neorealists, these several directors that made up this movement, what was their historical context? Uh, in the historical context, you'll see we mentioned the 40s and, and the 50s uh, earlier. And so if we're talking about the 1940s, we of course are talking about the horrors that uh, together made up the Second World War. And in the Second World War, Italy found itself in a very, very uh, strange position. Right? In the beginning, it found itself on the side of the Axis powers. Right? Or on the wrong side of history. Okay, so uh, you could say up front, Italy was one of the, the bad guys, one of the antagonists in the Second World War. And we can talk about uh, very briefly why this was the case, and you will know this hopefully from, from various history classes at school. Uh, why was it the case that Italy joined the Axis powers? Well, we know that uh, in the decades preceding the Second World War, specifically in the late 20s and the 30s, the fascists, led by Benito Mussolini, had seized power in Italy. Right, so they had come to power before the advent of, of the Second World War. And because they were fascist in orientation, they naturally aligned themselves with other fascist states, uh, namely and most notably, of course, uh, Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany. Right, during the war, the Allied powers defeated the Axis powers in Italy. Uh, if I remember correctly, this is about 42, 43. 1942 or 43. Uh, you'll have to check that date. Uh, but during the war, the Allied powers defeated the Axis powers in Italy. Uh, Mussolini attempted to escape, but he was caught by partisans and was brutally executed. Right, hung upside down and executed. Uh, and so then, from that point onwards, Italy kind of switched sides, and uh, Mussolini was gone, and they were no longer the bad guys now, they were kind of joined the Allied side of the equation, and they became the good guys. So Italians lived through this really strange experience during World War II, where they were the bad guys and the good guys at kind of the, the same time. It was an immensely... Uh, schizophrenic kind of uh, experience and this had a massive massive kind of psychological impact for for ordinary Italians what did this mean for ordinary Italians this idea that you could both be bad and good at the same time that everything in a sense was uh, a shade of gray what did it mean for them well uh, first up the Italian population were, for the most part, not in any way great supporters of Mussolini and his fascist regime. Through coercion, uh, oppression, and propaganda, they had little choice but to fall in with the, that regime. Uh, with the defeat of Italy and the Axis powers in 45, ordinary Italians wanted to disassociate themselves with the negative image they had gained. So the, the Italian neorealist filmmakers, what they would try to do in their film, what they attempted to show was that Italians, rather than being evil, uncritical supporters of fascism, were simply ordinary people caught up in an impossibly difficult situation both before the war, during it, and uh, afterwards. And the thing that you really want to, to, to focus on, the thing that you really want to, to, to circle, is that idea of an impossibly difficult situation. A lot of the films that you'll see that fall under this movement, they deal with people, ordinary, real people, caught up in impossibly difficult situations. Right? The focus is on real people in difficult circumstances. It's going to be very, very different than that Italian cinema you saw before that focused on 
glitz and glamour and the glory of Italy and so forth. It was a completely, uh, a complete kind of 180 turn. These guys would focus on real people and their, their struggles. So it was diametrically uh, opposed. Right, what are some of the, the features? Uh, of course, in lecture eight, next time we are going to go into it in, in immense detail. And we are going to do this kind of very quick little introduction, but it's a good thing to do. And that's why we're doing it in lecture seven. What, what, what are some of the core features of Italian neorealism? This is what you'll always find in a neorealist film. Um, you'll always find the following. A. The stories are always going to be set amongst the poor and the working class. So as we said, it's not glitz, it's not glamour, it's not the glorification of the country. It's about ordinary people in difficult situations. And remember here, we always speak about agency and we said um, the typical film you watch, especially our American experience of cinema, we always talk about that concept of, of agency, the idea that in those films, those American films, uh, the, the, the protagonist always has absolute agency. Something happens to him or her, but we know that they are going to overcome it. As an individual, they have the power to overcome their circumstances. But the Italians are, are different in this, or the neorealists specifically are different in this, in that they show that sometimes, no matter how hard an individual tries, their circumstances might still get the better of them. So they really question the idea of individual agency, right? Very, very important. So A, the stories are set amongst the poor and the working class. It's always filmed on location. Uh, here's a very interesting thing. And this is something you want to take note of already. Uh, they frequently use non-professional actors. What these guys are trying to do, the Italian neorealists and anybody that uses their technique, is blur the lines between fiction and reality. Right? So they're trying to blur those lines between documentary and fiction. So if you watch one of these films, you're not quite sure. My goodness. Uh, is this a documentary? Is this a film? What is this precisely? They kind of play around with uh, that tension between reality and fiction. Okay, very, very important. So they frequently use non-professional actors. Uh, and as we said, we've said this a few times, uh, Italian neorealist films mostly contend with the difficult economic and moral conditions of Italians post-World War II, representing changes in the Italian psyche and conditions of everyday life, including poverty, oppression, injustice, and desperation. So it's all the ugly stuff. Poverty, oppression, injustice, and desperation. Right? They don't look at the lovely stuff. It's not a cute uh, romantic comedy or something. It's not a breezy, fun film. It's something that looks into the lived experience of the majority. Uh, Got it here. I've said pretty much the same thing, just in a little bit more detail. Let's read through it and see if there's anything uh, interesting or, or, or helpful here. So, what are some of the features? We're talking about the things that you'll typically find in, in, in an Italian neorealist film. Uh, and we've said this already. They are generally filmed with non-professional actors. Although in a number of cases, well-known actors were cast in leading roles, playing strongly against their normal character types in front of a background populated by local people, rather than extras brought in for the film. Right, so the lead, the lead character or the protagonist might sometimes be played by a more, more famous actor or actress, but the, the majority of those filmed are going to be typical, everyday people, that actually reside in the area that is being filmed about. 
Uh, they are almost shot exclusively on location, mostly in rundown cities as well as rural areas. Uh, importantly, as well, they're shot in location because there, well, essentially were no studios left after World War II in Italy. Everything had been destroyed and they didn't have the money as well to, to shoot in studio. So everything was, was on location. Uh, the topic involves the idea of what it is like to live among the poor and the lower working classes. And remember, this was something extremely evocative at the time. Nobody, uh, specifically in Italy, had filmed something like this before. Uh, in Italy, no one was interested at all in those poor or classes or lower working classes. Nobody was interested in the lives that they had led. So this was quite, quite something. The focus is on a simple social order of survival in rural, everyday life. Performances are mostly constructed from scenes of people performing fairly mundane and quotidian activities, devoid of the self-consciousness that amateur acting usually entails. Uh, and this is an exceptionally important point. Neorealist films often feature children in major roles. Though the characters are frequently more observational than participatory. And I want you guys to already think about this. Uh, this is something that you should kind of note down or a question you can ask yourself. Why? Why would these films often feature children? What do children symbolize? Why are these children observational characters? Why are they presented in the film as observing all these things that are happening in the society that they inhabit? Right? So ask yourself that question. Put a big, big circle or take a note about children and start thinking about in why would these children feature so strongly in these films? Why was there such a focus on children? Right, here's some of the big names. We're going to talk about some of the big names uh, involved in the movement. So the, up front, you'll see, see the biggest of all, I suppose, uh, Roberto Rossellini. Right, look at this film, Open City. It established several of the principles of neorealism, depicting clearly the struggle of normal Italian people. And again, there's the focus, normal Italian people, to live from day to day under the extraordinary difficulties of the German occupation of Rome, consciously doing what they can to resist the occupation. And I asked you that question about children earlier, and here they come up again. The children play a key role in this, and their presence at the end of the film is indicative of their role in neorealism as a whole. As observers of the difficulties of today, who hold the key to the future. So they are this, this, this uh, uh, moniker, in a sense, for renewal, for rebirth, for a tentative step towards the, the future. Here's a very important quote from Rossellini. He said, uh, when he made his films, or made this film and many and others like it, he stated that the situation of the moment, guided by my own and the actors' moods and perspectives, dictated what was shot. And he relied more on improvisation than on a script. So very, very important too. The idea that Italian neorealism isn't as rigid and neat and clean as other forms of cinema. It's improvisational. It's often guided by mood and perspective. A very, very interesting take on cinema. Something that you may be quite uh, unused to. Uh, there's another one, and this is a very important one uh, at the bottom here, at the last point. Uh, you can already say that Vittorio de Sisa's Bicycle Thief, this is probably the classic of the genre, 
and if you have the cap for it, I ask you to, to watch a clip or two on YouTube. I'll send you some links as well. Uh, Vittorio De Sisa's 1948 film, The Bicycle Thief, is also representative of the genre with non-professional actors and a story that details the hardships of working class life after the war. Very, very important, and please take note as well. It's this particular film, Bicycle Thief, that's a link to uh, African cinema, right? Or third world cinemas, as it was called. It's a link to a guy like Usman Samben, right? The Senegalese filmmaker and the, the, the father of African cinema. And we'll be talking a little bit about him and South American directors in lecture 9 or 10, probably. And here we'll be talking about the export of this Italian neorealist idea internationally, right? Specifically in the 1960s. This is when it started to gain traction internationally. Right. So, very, very important film. It, it would be a good idea for you guys to watch clips of these. All of them are... Um, easily and openly available on a platform like YouTube, uh, but I'll send you links as well. Okie dokie, let's see what else. Yeah, so that's it. That's the introduction uh, to Italian neorealism uh, in lecture eight, which we are going to do well, next time, not next week. Uh, we are going to read the course reader together and take notes and, and be very careful and thoughtful about it. But let's just kind of try to sum it up. What is uh, Italian neorealism all about? A, the focus is on ordinary people, right? The focus is on ordinary people. B, that sometimes don't have the agency and in individual power to overcome their circumstances. It's improvised, it's loose, uh, the camera and the people very often drift within the shots. It's going to be interesting, you'll see, especially as you watch certain shots from, from the clips I send you. It's a very unusual way of doing cinema. It's something that we are quite unused to. All right, so, lecture eight, we get into it, in-depth sophistication and nuance. Uh, until then.